Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. <laughs>
walking thing. Wizards, you can leave by the window as normal. But so I was never in that situation where I kind of got into it or I never seen the kind of the, I see why it's attractive and stuff like that. I can also see how much of a an actual money sink it can kind of be and why Netrunner was more attractive to a lot of people because there was already the prefabricated decks. You didn't need to go out and spend a hundred bucks trying to hope that you got kind of like a better deck. It was already kind of, kind of set up. But um, with the the Lord of the Rings card game, did you did you keep playing that for kind of some time? Did that kind of set you on a path to to look at other things? Then definitely, because I was playing it a lot, and I started buying a lot of expansions for it, and just really enjoying. I'm a perfectionist. I I really enjoy kind of tweaking things until I feel like they run just right, mm-hmm. and I like that aspect of, aspect of deck construction. Mm-hmm. But I also realized that I really liked playing games by myself at that time. And so I started Googling to see who else out there might be doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. And it just snowballed from there. So I ended up picking up stuff like Friday and you know Robinson Crusoe. Mm-hmm. You know, all the, the typical things that people start with. And then much not too much longer after that, I uh, started wanting to write about it. I think the reason I like to blog about solo gaming is because it's not like you're gaming with someone that you can talk to. So you put your thoughts about solo games out on the internet so that other people who are doing the same thing that you're doing might reach back and you can be social about gaming in that way as opposed to while you're actually playing and making all the decisions. Do you find that um, because of the nature of solo games that people do more house ruling? Do you find that you have a discussion about stuff and people will say, well, maybe I've tried doing this slightly instead and I had a better experience or... um, have you done that a lot yourself? Um, you know, when I review games, I prefer to review what's in the box. So I'll, I'll, I'll review something and I'll get comments about, oh, you know, if you do this, it hmm. works better. Um, I sort of feel like as a game reviewer, I like to stick to published material hmm. because I feel like that's what's polished and what somebody decided to show to the world. And is therefore like, I don't know, worthy of my assessment, as if that my assessment matters, right? But um, the... When it comes to playing by myself, yeah, absolutely. There are tons of house rules that I do. Like Sherlock Holmes, if you think that I actually play Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective with the, the idea of beating Sherlock Holmes instead of like reading all the flavor text and having a good time, you are wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I will I will definitely tweet games to make them more enjoyable for mm-hmm. me. And, you know, there's some really amazing people on board. Actually, um, I'm going to be posting soon. Uh, I got help from... Um, Elbon, uh, his he's Raz or Razupuff. I don't know how I actually pronounce that on um on Board Game Geek. He's actually put together a post for me of unsung heroes of solo gaming, and a lot of these people have been putting together interesting challenges for stuff like Aeon's End and just things they do on their own, their own you know little witches brew mm-hmm. games at home. And I'm actually really amazed by the things that the gaming community can make. Especially solo gamers, because you're just there, you know, cooking by yourself at your table trying to figure out how to make it really good. Do you make your own modes then? I mean, have you been responsible for kind of like saying, oh, I can do this? Not house ruling, but actually saying, well, let's try and do something completely different here. I have not. I've thought about it, but, um, you know, I've been really trying to build up what I'm currently doing with Beyond Solitaire, and I think eventually that's going to be something that I want to try, but... For now, I'm content to just play as much as I can and get a lot out there. Especially because when you're a reviewer, people really want regular um, regular reviews. Mm-hmm. So you spend a whole lot of time just playing new stuff, taking notes on your thoughts about it, playing it again, taking more notes. Maybe eventually that'll set me up, set me up to make something really cool myself, but not yet. Not ready yet. You started off, you said, you know, obviously you're talking about The Lord of the Rings. Where did you venture from kind of there? I mean, was there key games that you can kind of highlight and say, okay, I was, you know, this kind of cemented that I was enjoying the solo play. I mean, do you still group play with friends then? Or do you concentrate more yeah. on the on the solo stuff? Oh, no, I actually do group play. I, I'm, a, I'm one of those people who's a solo gamer because my desire to game outpaces the, the, the opportunities to meet other people mm. in game. Um. I have a normal game group on Tuesday nights, and I also am the co-sponsor of a game club at the school where I work on Fridays. Right. 
And um, I'm actually moving schools next year, but I fully expect that to continue. I've been a game club advisor at both of the other schools I've worked at previously. So <laughs> was that ma- was that yeah. mentioned at the interview then when you were having the chat? You're just like, yeah, saying, yeah I'm doing, I'm doing. It. I want you to know that part of me getting this job and accepting this role is there will be game club. And they're like, okay. Oh, it's not that aggressive. But <laughs> <laughs> actually, what's really fun about the next school I'm going to be at is that um, I'm going to be I'm I'm, I'm a Latin yeah. teacher. And I ask, you know, is there a game club? And it turns out that the game club is already run by a couple of the other Latin teachers. Wow. <laughs> so I'll just fit right in. <laughs> so it's like, was that, was it a kind of like a knowing nod when they're like, like saying, so you're, you're coming over to teach Latin. I run a game club. It's like, yeah, we know. We've already got, <laughs> we've okay. So actually it's even, it's even crazier than that. I actually play Dungeons and Dragons with a couple mm. of my new colleagues already. <laughs> It was, I did not expect to actually end up working with them, but, um, you know, we were already nerding out together pretty regularly, so it was a natural, a natural. It just sounds to me, Liz, that you're kind of building this so you can actually play games while you're at work. I mean, this just is this, but this is where this is going. Uh, This is kind of going to be. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. I have translated some games into Latin. Like, I have a Latin version of Love Letter. That would be cool. That I made by translating it into Latin and then like getting some garbage clip art and like putting it on there. Yeah. <laughs> do you actually do you use kind of like characters, Roman characters and stuff like that then on the art? Have you done all that? Yeah, like I changed the guard to Custos and like put like a Roman guard on there. And you know, there's a Latin word for princess. I just use that principissa, you know, for princess. But you know, the king, the prince. There's there's Roman equivalents for that. Like, oh, let's just call him a Rex. Let's just call him a Prince Caps. Mm. There's there's Latin words for that. So we just made it and played it. It was really fun. You not approached like the actual publisher and said, "Here, look," because let's face it, they've got every other version of Love Letter out there. I mean, I'm sure a Latin version. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> That will sell so many copies. I just think, well, I, you, I think you'd be surprised. <laughs> you know, you just have to get it into kind of like the Latin, the Latin kind of teacher's pool. You know, you just have to be a, like, you know, next time they have their conference, you just need to set up a little little there... stall and just say, get, you know. So that is possible. There actually is like this underground world of knockoff Latin merchandise. So students make club t-shirts and stuff for, <laughs> for the state and national conventions for Latin. And so um, I've actually, I didn't get a shirt from this printing, but fortunately, because I know the teachers, I can ask. Um, so there's a Roman general called Pompey the Great. You'll know this. But uh, somebody had a shirt that said, I like it when you call me Big Pompey. <laughs> and I have to have it. <laughs> I just have to. Do you have... <laughs> Is there like a whole thing? And there's a, there's, a, I'm sure there's a forum out there that's got like Latin memes, popular memes in Latin. Yeah, my classroom door's covered with them. <laughs> Just totally. <laughs> my students send them to me periodically, and you know, another of my students actually, I'm not going to disclose the name of the Instagram account because it's a teenager, yeah. but you know, he made this Instagram for his history class yeah. with like some really great images, including a Mary Beard steal her look. <laughs> graphic <laughs> and you know all the textbooks that people read in school like they make memes about them so if you do the cambridge latin mm. course there's this whole family right with like this kind of sketchy cook named grumio and you know this kid who you know sits in a somewhat provocative way while he drinks his <laughs> drink in the dining room and all stuff and then these images show up on t-shirts and buttons and it's actually really great it's the entire latin <laughs> subculture which you never knew you needed <laughs> but you have to have we need the chibi dog <laughs> was it <laughs> you know the, <laughs> you know so so latin you know <laughs> much soldiers <laughs> you know many pompey actually i do have a latin <laughs> doge meme on the door that is a thing yeah <laughs> Just getting cold. But I think my favorite one is I have the most interesting man in the world. That's my favorite one. It's like I don't always speak dead languages, but when I do, locor latine, (laughs) stay Roman, my friends. (laughs) I mean, I could probably get in trouble for that because he's holding a beer on the meme. But like, it's 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 nothing. Nobody's ever said anything. It's not like you know. You're not telling him to drink beer. It's fine. Of course not. But the thing is here. So what we're establishing here is that um, you're essentially. Gonna go in home 
And instead of like getting a bottle of wine and helping yourself after going to the pub with your friends, you're getting a bit of kind of like board games kind of by yourself to kind of continue, continue on, continue playing, keep yourself kind of going. Um, with, do you think solo mode games are becoming more and more prevalent? Do you think the solo mode in a game is becoming more and more prevalent as kind of time goes on? Yes, I absolutely believe that it is more prevalent. I think that now is the best time to be a solo mm. gamer in terms of the attention and pandering that we're starting to get from publishers. Mm. And I'm here for that. <laughs> I will say that with that um, comes the risk of more tacked on solo modes. Yeah. So the desire to provide one in order to increase the player count and make the game more marketable doesn't always lead to the best gameplay experience for an actual solo player just because you want to play it solo doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going to be best that way um that said i mean we're seeing some really amazing stuff coming out like i mean anachrony's back on kickstarter they're updating the chronobot which is already mm-hmm. good you know we've, we're starting to have these people who do really good solo designs uh like david turtsy you know keith Matega does really cool stuff with um with the role player universe um, I've just been really excited, you know, AJ Porfirio's hostage negotiator career is out on Kickstarter right now. I'm really pumped about that. That's, that was one of my very earliest solo games. I've been with that for a long time. Um, and just enjoying it over the course of years at this point. So, you know, the development and I guess recognition of designers like that, publishers like that, games like that is really exciting for me because I think that we only go up from here. Do you think... That sometimes when a reviewer is reviewing a game for a multiplayer, sometimes they base part of the review, they play the game themselves, play it through to familiarise themselves with the rules. So they're almost like kind of solo mode in it. I know the first time I normally play a game, I will normally sit there by myself and kind of play it through, even if it's a multiplayer game, just to get the kind of the feel of the game right. as well. And I see that. I see that kind of happen. I um, I, I, t- I do often wonder if kind of time pressure means that some people are playing kind of multiplayer games in a kind of a solo player mode. But So that's really interesting that you say that because one of the reasons I am really grateful that I have a solo review site is that I'm not dependent on my playtesting group to get the place. Mm. You know, I don't need to coordinate with other people to make sure the games get played, to make sure they get played the right number of times. I have complete control over what I'm playing, when I'm playing it, how many times in a row I play it, how much breathing space I give between games. It's really nice not to be dependent on other people's schedules yeah. in order to write my reviews. So, I mean, I will definitely sometimes in reviews say, like, I think this is probably better multiplayer. I've played it a couple times that way. But my reviews are very solo specific because that is that's the playing condition in which... I I get most of my notes written and most of my plays in. Um, I think everybody's a secret solo gamer in the sense that they set games up and run them themselves to make sure they work. <laughs> but the question is, do you enjoy that beyond? Mm, some people do, some people don't. But yeah, I, I don't think that... I think the people who are doing multiplayer reviews tend to have groups. So, you know, like Glenn from Board Games and Bourbon... Yeah. Um, Get he has a group that meets regularly, and I think that that's where he play tests a lot of his games. I think behind every multiplayer review is a group of really loyal friends who are going to be there with you through the review process. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder if um, if you're doing kind of like because you're doing the solo mode games, if you actually kind of play the game an awful lot more than if you're doing the multiplayer reviews, because the multi. The ones that um, there's um, Giles who does both sides of my table, and his reviews mm-hmm, are mm-hmm. like they're documents. They're fabulous. They go into so much detail. He talks about multiplayer and single player and solo mode, and he really, really goes into mm-hmm. review. He actually, you know, he can delve into the kind of the nitty gritty of what makes it work and what doesn't make it work. And I'm wondering, do, you, do you, I'm wondering if would I be right in maybe saying that solo mode gamers maybe see as much as what the game has to offer in terms of its potential than sometimes a multiplayer player does because sometimes they might only get it to the table once or twice 
Yeah, there may be some truth to that. I think that even I, however, even a game that I've played a lot, I haven't played enough times to fully feel like that's my game that I know really mm-hmm. well. There are only a few games, if we're being super honest, that I feel like coming home when I play them. Yeah. And I don't have to refresh myself on the rules when I pick it back up. And, you know, at the time that I write the review, I'm running pretty hot on the game and I know what I'm doing mm-hmm. because that's what I owe to the people who read and who watch. But um, I think that we're in an age where there's so many new games coming out that we don't know our games very deeply. Yes. And we don't tend to play the same games again and again. And so I think that a lot of us are missing probably a lot of games that have limits that we haven't hit or strategic depths that we haven't appreciated because we're just not playing them enough. Again, um, Raz on Board Game Geek, I have mentioned he will play something hundreds of times before he reviews it. He he releases very infrequently mm. and sometimes in French. So I'm really glad I took grad school exams that let me read them. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, so there are a few people out there who are doing these really, really in-depth reviews but I think most of us who are, have like the routine audiences and are expected to kind of put stuff out every one to two weeks on YouTube, we're not doing that. Actually, as I'm moving, I'm going to be trying to move apartments soon. One of the things I'm really interested in doing is cutting my game collection down yeah, and making sure that I spend more time with the games that I really like. like I love Sentinels and Multiverse. I would just play that all the time if I didn't feel like I had to play something new to write about on my site. And I want to take some more of that time for myself this year. Or like Spirit Island. I would love to do videos that are like in-depth spirit strategy guides yeah. or something. Something that's a little bit different from the how to play, how to solo kind of quick guide that I've normally been doing. Because I I, I long for that in my own gaming life. Yeah, I, can't, I kind of... I mean, you touched on the point that you don't think people get into the depth. I don't... I mean, there's been discussions about value of money for a board game. And how much, you know, how much, mm-hmm. how much value of money, do, you know, do you get if you buy a game for 50 bucks and you're lucky if you get a game for $50 nowadays, are you getting, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You know, are you getting $50 worth of game out of that, out of playtime? Or are you playing it once because you feel guilty enough? We're in a solo mode. I can sit and watch. I can be watching something off to the side that maybe my partner's watch binge watching on Netflix and I can just be playing a quick kind of solo game and I'm getting uh-huh. used to it and I'm getting kind of value in it. And the interesting thing is a lot of the solo games I've seen seem to be of the smaller kind of box variety. Um which again kind of seems to kind of add the value for money, but I feel on the the solo games I play, I feel I'm getting value out of what I've purchased as opposed to try to get everybody around the table to play Scythe. I've played Scythe, what, four, three, four times mm-hmm, at the most? Mm-hmm. And it's like if I had, you know, if I taught up probably what I've spent on games based on the hours I've played, I would probably throw everything <laughs> in the bin. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think I got Friday for like 11 or $12 long mm-hmm. ago. I have really gotten the you know cost per play of that one way down <laughs> but these things you know i do love these big box fantasy experiences by myself too for me solo gaming is partially because i have a gaming urge that can't i mean unless some, there are people to play with me all day every day mm. i would not be satisfied with the gaming group but it's also um it's also a matter of i really like to kind of get really imaginative and spread the whole like map in front of me and get really into it and you know, it's for me, it's like reading a novel or watching a movie. And I do also really love those experiences when I can get them. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a place for small box solo games for sure. I love them. You know, I have lots of games that I will like travel with or have in my car, or have in my bag. And, you know, Sprawlopolis is really impressive to me for how much a game you can mm. get out of 18 cards. It's so small and it's so tricky. I love it. I think there's a really great place for, for small games. But I also, you know, I also. Think about the games that are breaking a million on Kickstarter right now all the time. It's these huge miniatures games. Although I, I wonder if the age of the giant Kickstarter will start to slow down. I don't. I don't have a hundred bucks to pop off for every game that I want. I have a. I have a really. I happen. have a really big rant I want to go into at some point, but this episode is not the point for this rant <laughs> about a certain campaign that's running at the moment where key parts of the campaign or key parts of the experience are being locked behind a 
a kind of a paywall and I'm not going to go into mm-hmm. it but um, but you mentioned kind of like solo mode games having like a, well solo mode games being tacked on to kind of bigger mm-hmm. games I mean are there games that kind of like are there games that do it really really badly that you've just been like I hate this because it's just here to be a cash grab or just here to appease people or Yes, I'm not going to name names because that could, I don't want, I'm not feeling that controversial type, but yeah, I've absolutely, I've absolutely slammed games for having tact on Solomos before. Um, <laughs> uh, I try to be really classy, but honest <laughs> in my reviews <laughs> so that you're getting the absolute truth for me, but I'm a teacher, right? Yeah. So we know how to do that. Well, you know, I saw promise in area X and Y, however you could use work here. <laughs> Do you not just come out and just say yeah. I'm disappointed, or do you not just write "see me after class" frowny face? Oh, I should do. I should just do that. Well, the other <coughs> thing is, you know, I normally will review any solo game that comes through my hands, but I've had a couple where the solo mode was so pointless that I just didn't bother because I didn't want to spend my time doing it. Would you, in that case, would you go back to the designer and actually feed back to them and say? I can't spend time in this because your solo mode is, you know, is as useful as a chocolate teapot um, kind of thing. Or would you feed back to them and um, help? De- or are you just like, kind of like, I, I can't devote time to this. This is going to take time and I'd rather play a game that is doing it properly. Yeah. So honestly, it depends. If it's a publisher that I have an actual relationship mm-hmm. with, because, you know, it's somebody that who's opinion I actually care about, who actually seems to care about my opinion, then I'll be honest. Um, I've also sent back games that people wanted me to preview for Kickstarter before. Mm -hmm. Um, So, not everybody agrees with me on this. I know that there's lots of controversies online all the time about doing Kickstarter previews. I've actually really backed off of doing them. I don't do too many anymore. Because I believe that every Kickstarter preview, even if it's, quote, neutral, is marketing material. You've created an ad for that game. (laughs) But, you know, I think that that's something you should only do for games that you really think people should put their money on. So, you know, I'm going to be previewing Alter Quest when that comes out because I'm legitimately excited about Alter Quest. Yeah. I think Street Masters is great. I've got Brook City out. I'm enjoying my early plays yeah. of that. You know, I haven't, I'm not ready to review it yet. But, you know, for me, that's like a tried and true. Like, I trust that my experience of previewing that game is going to be a positive experience. If it weren't, I would probably send a quick message to the Saddlers and be like, uh, we should talk. So, yeah. yeah. But the thing is that once you've done that, so like, I've sent a Kickstarter back and it just turned into a lot of work. Because it was like trying to break up with someone and having them want to do like a whole post-mortem on your relationship. of like, what exactly <laughs> went wrong? And, you know, it's, that's work that I'm not getting clicks for. That's time out of yeah. my life that I could spend playing other games. So, I'm willing to give some feedback to publishers, but I don't think it's my job to spend hours helping other people design games that they should have put their work into and done the playtest for. Yeah, I'm actually less likely to go ahead and write or even consider writing anything or producing content for that person if I then get embroiled in the rules kind of discussion. Because then it's like, well, where's Mm -hmm. my impartiality? If I know I've kind of helped with this, then I've obviously given advice. Therefore, I can't be impartial because I've given that kind of person kind of advice um i generally i I don't know i'm so gray and wooly with regards to kind of kickstarter previews because i've even gone to just call them kind of like first thoughts or first impressions and that's me back to the thing where i'm saying Mm -hmm. well i am probably not going to be able to spend get 10 playthroughs or five playthroughs on these things sometimes i'll you know i'll look through them um I'll see what what grabs me about it. Sometimes, you know, when I've written stuff in the past, it's been completely irrelevant to the actual game. And it's just because um, it's just a fun piece, you know, just to drive a bit of kind of, you know, I did a whole piece about um, Sean Epperson, a thing, 12 Games, did a thing called The Seals of Cthulhu. And I spent Mm -hmm. 500 words ranting about the fact there wasn't any actual seals in this game. (laughs) Um because Sean's a friend, you know. Sean, I know Sean quite well, so it was a kind of thing. Well, we, you know, what I, I says, well, I can't, I can't write a preview for the game because I can't write a preview for the game because I know you too well, and that would be considered, as you said, kind of market material. But let's do something along the sides that'll be silly and daft, and I can just say, look, it was just a, a nonsense, you know. Um, is that that kind of thing? How, how do you go from playing 
games to saying, right, I want to make some content here. I want to get my words down. I'm going to get my videos out there. What What was the turning point when you said, well, actually, you know, because obviously you're a teacher, so you're used to kind of disseminating information yeah. to people and obviously teachers always have to be some kind of, there has to be a performance in the teaching, you know. Um, well, unless, you know, obviously I would never be a teacher because I'd end up just wearing a clown outfit. But, I mean, what, <laughs> it's a true story, but <laughs> what, what kind of made you sit down and say, right, okay, um, I'm going to do something with this and, and actually help kind of get the word kind of out there? Well, you know, Beyond Solitaire, all the earlier posts are, some of them are pretty experimental. Um, you know, I was just kind of shouting out into the void my feelings about solo games because nobody else played solo in, in my immediate vicinity. And I, I think I just wanted that sense of connection. Mm -hmm. And then maybe late 2017, I realized, okay, I have some choices with this with this hobby of mine. Um, I can either just kind of keep futzing around, or I can do a really consistent site and channel. You know, I was already making videos for Throw Punch Lunch, mm -hmm. then Token Punch Lunch, now sadly deceased. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I was starting to make content Ugh, i don't like that word very much um and you know i was starting to be part of the online board game community but i didn't really have a lot of focus yeah and so i basically had a put up or shut up moment where i was like okay you need to decide what you are and what you're doing and what you're doing that's actually worth something to other people i really believe that when you create media that your job is to make something that other people legitimately could use or get something out of that's not about you. I mean, there's a little ego in it, right? We all want people to read what we write and listen to what we say because we think that it is worth something or else we wouldn't say it. But for me, utility is part of it. So I was like, okay, what can I do to build the most useful site for solo gamers possible? So I started pairing, I have, unlike Giles, who writes really good long form, yeah. you know, I have very short reviews that, you know, you can TLDR, go to the bottom, see what I think. I try to keep it very structured, the same structure every time, and very blunt, so that that way you can get what I thought very quickly. Yeah. Um, and then I pair it for games that I rated a three or higher. So I'm, I'm a harsher rater than most. I rate things mostly in the three range, which means it's fine. It's a totally good game. I enjoyed it. But I don't think it's a greatness because I think a lot of like fine games are out there. But I don't necessarily think that there are a lot of great games out there. No, I agree with you there. I'm picky yeah, about yeah, it. yeah. But if I like it and I think it's a perfectly good game that anybody could buy and enjoy, at that point I will decide to film a how to solo tutorial for it and throw that on YouTube because I think that it's worth my time to teach someone who is by themselves and trying to figure it out how to play it because. Lord knows I watched a lot of other people's videos. You know, Ricky Royal taught me to play Mage Knight. Taught a, how, how, who knows how many people Ricky Royal has taught how to play Mage Knight at this point. But, you know, I thought that that was so useful. I really enjoyed what other people were doing. And I thought, hey, I'm a teacher. I can do that. So I started trying it. And it's just kind of gone from there. Did you make... When you're making... When you're making things, are you making them as much for yourself as you are for other people? Do you have to kind of have that mindset that you're getting out... And saying I need to make this because um, I don't think what I do provides anything more than kind of maybe hopefully entertainment in some way, shape, or form. I'm not sure if anybody gets. I know that I know that my guests provide a lot of information and insight when they listen and stuff like that. But me, I'm just like I think I facilitate. The ability for somebody to come on and tell everybody about what they're doing and what they're kind of involved in. Um, for some, I mean, for you, somebody like yourself, are you? Do you think about? Do you consider like what the audience might be looking for, or are you a case of just? I have started making stuff, and I find I've just naturally got into a groove, and I'm getting good at it, so I might as well kind of continue. Or do you kind of are you chasing kind of after are there certain games you're trying to chase to kind of fit in with what the audience kind of need? I mean, it's a different kind of you know. Yeah. Okay, that's a really interesting question. So I am definitely it's it's a combo. 
So in terms of the format that I'm creating for my site and for my channel, you know, I use my own stuff too when I forget rules for things or if I want to remember what I thought about a mm -hmm. game. I find that reviewing games really clarifies my feelings about them. So I hope that it's useful to other people, but it's also a useful exercise for me because it really forces me to sift through what I thought was good and bad about a game. What do I really like in a game? You know, do I want to trade this game or keep it? So, you know, I'm about to downsize. I'm going to be looking at my own reviews for games and being faced with my own words when I get sentimental. Mm. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, I hope that my tutorials are helpful to other people. Sometimes if I forget something, I can go back and watch myself and it feels really weird. I actually prefer to be taught by other people. Mm. But, you know, um, I think that having a variety of teaching styles out there is good. As for chasing hot games. Okay, this is a hard one. If I wanted more views and more subscribers, I would chase more hot games and I would get them out faster. I am trying really hard not to do it because I think that that would compromise some of the quality of what I'm doing. The time pressure would be more, you know, in terms of how I spend my own game money. I might not be buying the games that I want to buy. Yeah. You know, I get some review copies, but I still buy a good chunk of the games that I review. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't want to spend my money on somebody else's gaming experience. No. <laughs> no offense to anybody. But, you know, you don't want to you don't want to get trapped in that. Actually, I you know, I'd been gearing up to launch a Patreon and I decided against it because I didn't want to feel the obligation or the pressure to do what I thought other people wanted me to be doing all the time. And I have backed off of Kickstarter previews in part because they're a little bit addictive. They get a lot of hits. Yes. You know, um, they, I do not regret doing so. I mean, I, I feel like I've, I've previewed a lot of winners. You know, I've done stuff. I did Mech Key recently. I have no regrets about that. That's a fabulous game. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, okay, yeah. You know, I did Black Sonata. Yeah. I've done, you know, Unbroken. Uh, I do a lot of solo bots for weird giraffe games because I think that Carla is worthy of attention from solo players because she makes fascinating solo modes <laughs> and I want to showcase that. So, you know, I think that, I mean, I'm choosing things that really matter to me, but I don't want to be that person who does Kickstarter previews because then it's not long before you're spending a lot of time on games you don't really like that much and knowing that your video is going to be sold as if you do. <laughs> yeah, I, I have, a, I kind of have a... <laughs> I have a double list myself. I have like um, people that kind of ask. No, I've got people that have got genuine friends in the industry who that when they've got a campaign coming out, they'll say, can I come on the show? And the answer is always yes, because I know that we'll, you know, we'll just take the piss out of each other and have a laugh and it'll all be good, kind of good fun. And it's like, Car you know, it's like you mentioned Carla. Carla's been on the show a couple of times. Um, Artem, who did Unbroken's being on the shows, um, mm -hmm. Black Snat and McKee, um, they've been on the shows. <laughs> Actually, it's like I'm just like, yeah, I've had them on. I've had them on. I'm feeling embarrassed now. Yeah. But then, no, not at all, because that's those are quality. I've I'm very proud to have done preview videos for them. But that's the thing, I'm proud to have done. Yeah, it. and I never charge to do it for me. It, it that's what feels best for me. Yeah. I mean, on my side, um, there's a list of people I'd like to get on the show. I mean, I had um, Elizabeth Hargrave. She was on the show, um, mm -hmm. and she was talking about... We kind of touched on Wingspan, but I, I'll i be honest, and I stole it at the time, I didn't know it was only after we had had a, we had had a little kind of discussion on Twitter because I put a post up saying, there's key people I'd like to get. I'd love Eric Lang to come on at some point. I just want him on. Matt Lees from Shut Up and mm -hmm. Sit Down. You know, there's guys on the list that i just like to come on. And Elizabeth kind of went, oh, you should ask, here's a list of women you should have on the show as well. And then I went, would you want to come on the show? And then at the time, it didn't twig until five minutes later that she was the designer of Wingspan. And then I went, <gasps> and that kind of thing. But there is kind of people, <laughs> there is kind of people I'm chasing that I would like on the show. But at the same time, there's kind of like the people that, kind of chase me to come on the show because they're doing kind of Kickstarter campaigns and they need kind of media coverage. So it's kind of strange. I have no idea where I'm going with this and my point is probably nonsense and has no bearing at all on our discussion, but I'm continuing to to talk anyway. No, that's how you... Anyway. That's how you sift things out. Yes. So I've actually done a few interviews now with designers and I want to keep doing it, um, but I typically will play a game, get really interested in it and want to keep talking about it. Mm. So I talked to Sami Lakso about Dawn of Peacemakers and pacifism Damn. in games like as a theme. Um, I talked to David Thompson about Pavlov's House because I thought that game was really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. 
I really, really, really like that one. And we talked about, you know, game as historical statement and, um, you know, the, the reconstructive work he had to do to kind of recreate the situation in Pavlov's house mm. uh, that doesn't totally match up with propaganda from the time looking for documents. I, I thought that was really interesting. There's so many cool things to talk about related to games that aren't reviewing them or teaching people how to play them. So I've started to explore that part of my interest in gaming more. But for that, I think you need not just any game. You need a game that's actually making some sort of interesting statement about something. Yeah. To really get the meat out for me. Yeah. I. I but I'm an academic at heart, so. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just nosy at heart. You know, so I like, you know, if, you know, there's a lot of times I've had a guest on the show and we've ended up not talking about the game at all, but ended up talking about them, <laughs> you know, completely. Because it, it's kind of interesting as kind of like, they're interesting as a person, just to find out kind of like their journey, what kind of person kind of makes a game a certain way or what has kind of influenced them as a kind of... um child to play games that set them down their kind of like path i mean when ben maddox was on we spoke about acting for like ages and mm-hmm. i could have continued that i ideally i'd like to have a whole section of podcasts where we had like creators on that just talked about stuff which had nothing to do with board games with them as a person <laughs> well i'll tell you probably one of the reasons that my site and channel have ended up the way that they have is from advice that my PhD advisor gave me when I was working on my dissertation. Mm -hmm. Um, He said that being useful is the most important thing because scholarship that's trendy comes and goes and it'll be replaced in 20, 30 years, if that, if it makes it that far now. Mm -hmm. But something that has a really useful and measured approach is something that people are still going to cite forever from now. And, you know, I, I really would like Beyond Solitaire to be something that people are still looking at in five years, ten years, because the archives on it are useful enough to justify that for them. So if you're looking for something and trying to figure out how to play it, those videos are still there. Those reviews are still there for you, even if the game isn't hot right now. Which I think is important. Because as you go mm-hmm. back to what we were saying earlier on about kind of like chasing the hotness and being... The problem with chasing the hotness is that you end up there with another 15 or so videos that are all doing the same thing. Like, you know, as I say, when Wingspan came out, there were a whole pile of content out there, videos, reviews, pretty much all saying the same thing as well. There wasn't anything that, you know, people were saying, oh, here's the the latest thing. You've you've seen it on New York Times or whatever. This is the latest thing that everybody's kind of after. Right. But then I was looking, say... um, I was looking at a couple of games today and I was looking at older articles from reviewers and stuff like that because I wanted to see what the game was about and if it would kind of like, if it would fit with me. And I still think that's a very, very important thing because there's a lot of games that are out there in the wild because as we both know, there's thousands of games out there. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But um, there's not always the backup there to say whether it's a game that somebody should consider, even like a gameplay video or a simple kind of preview or review or anything like that. So it's kind of... It's kind of simple. Have you not thought about kind of going down the lines of taking it to the next level and saying, look, if you want to get a solo mode developed, I am that person. Give me money. No. No. It would suck all the joy out of this for me. At least you're honest. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if I... Okay. If somebody offered me an industry job that pays as much as I make to teach, which isn't that much, but I'm pretty sure industry jobs pay less... (laughs) I would seriously consider it, actually. I love working on board games. If that was my job job, that'd be great. Mm. But coming home from work, you know, teaching is really draining. One of the reasons that it's good to play alone sometimes is that I am not always fit for company after day of school. Yeah. It's like putting on several matinees to audiences that don't want to be there. And <laughs> Yeah, just like that. You know, and, and, and try to convince them that they do. And that is a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. And, you know, sometimes I'm just too tired for it you know i would really feel resentful if i came home and had to play a game i suppose i've always regretted those choices on that front actually i was gonna like spend Um, some of the time when i was speaking to you just like doing this (laughs) 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 just like pretending to be on my phone just going what what's that now the story of my life i'll do it in a minute i need to go can i get the hall pass please i need to go (laughs) 
Only let out one at a time. One Never let them out in packs. Time. It's like Lord of the Rings out there. You're going to go out on the <laughs> journey to Mordor. <laughs> but um, no, I actually really love teaching and I, I love my job. I think it's a great job, but I don't, and you know, I actually do freelance work as well. Um, so I'm a freelance coptologist. I work on a linguistics project and help a computer learn to distinguish the relationships between Coptic words better okay so you know i already i already do a lot of work you know i want my hobby to be fun <laughs> and you don't want the pressure so, yeah. do you you don't want the pressure of somebody saying because no. you could turn around and say this game is this is never going to work this solo mode isn't going to work no matter how many how many times we try and play it um what about what about what jamie stegmar does i mean they talk about the automata on kind of like scythe and viticulture and stuff like mm-hmm. that is that any good, or is it just because it's in there and people love Jamie that they're saying it's good? Ooh. So, actually, for me, it depends on the game. Okay. Um. So, I really like to play Viticulture. Yes. Uh, but I do sometimes find that the... Um, I'll tell them it's a... Um, that they rush you too hard through the game in ways that a human player can't or won't. Yeah. And it changes the experience. So I was not a big fan of Charterstone. I'll be real. Um, I thought that n- not only was it not the funnest game I've ever played, but um, I felt that the, the automated player was pushing me to go for points in ways that prevented me from doing the funnest part, which is like opening boxes and seeing what happens and putting stickers yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Because you have to watch that score so closely that you don't always do the things that your natural curiosity would lead you to do. Mm. And in a game like Charterstone, that's about opening up boxes and discovering new things. It was kind of contradictory for me. Um, the Wingspan Automa is fun, but I'm not convinced that the game isn't always going to be a big egg rush at the end. Right, okay. So... You know, I mean, it's it's fun. I love the game. I've been playing it with other people. It's good to teach to students. But, you know, I, I'm not sure that the Automa doesn't exacerbate that score rush at the end. That's already there in a multiplayer game. But I think that in a solo game where you're really trying to beat one automated opponent, that it makes issues like that more apparent. Is there a game that's got a solo mode that people just simply aren't shouting enough about that you've seen? That you've went, you've Ew. got to play this because it's got a brilliant solo mode game. But for whatever reason, because of maybe the game itself, people aren't kind of reaching for it. This is the difficult question part of the show. Ew. Okay, so there are a lot of games out there that just don't get enough attention generally. So one of my favorite games of this year is actually Wars of Marcus Aurelius oh, right. from um, Hollenspiele. It's a solo-only game where you are basically trying to control this um, set of issues with the uh, with a bunch of Germanic tribes while you are also you know trying to keep things from falling apart in Rome and you're trying to... I mean, it's like you're, you're just trying to balance a lot as Marcus Aurelius. It's really fun. There are lots of neat little historical references that make the game like a little sweeter for me. Mm-hmm. But I love the making decisions. What cards do I keep? What cards do I use in an event? Do I use this card for something else? What are the barbarians going to do next round? And I've really just gotten a lot of entertainment and repeat play out of mm-hmm. it. And I think it's something that is because that game is not sold in regular stores. And it's not big the way that a boutique store like Chip Theory Games would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah it doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. I also think that um, there's a lot of really good solo rolling rights out there. Like, I love Castles of Rigney card game. <laughs> I really, I mean, dice game. Not Well, the card game's good too, but I really like the dice yeah. game. Um, you know, I get a kick out of that one. I take it everywhere. Um, let's see. People have been talking about it, but I thought Fleet Dice Solo was really good. If you want, like, the quick ones. I haven't reviewed Cartographers yet, but I have enjoyed my plays of that. Um... Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's like a diamond in the rough that's not getting enough attention right now that I can think of, but that may be because I've missed it. It's also hard, like when you when you play as many games as I do and talk to people who are into games, it's hard to know what other people have heard of outside of your circle. Yeah. Like I think that that's I have a lot of perspective issues with that 
because I don't know what people have and haven't heard of because in my world, everybody's heard of everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you, um, what game needs a solo mode that you'd like to see? Who needs a solo mode? A proper solo mode. A, a, a Liz solo mode. solo mode. What do I wish I could play by myself that I can't? Ooh, there's a lot of those. Um, you know what I really want to see? I want to see a solo mode for Concordia. Yeah. I love Concordia. I don't know how you do it, but I'd really like it. I was also playing Tyrants of the Underdark the other night. I thought that would be sort of fun to have an automated opponent. But the thing is, I don't know how you'd handle the area control mechanically. There's probably somebody who knows how to do it. There would it, be. Not me. You'd have to... You'd have to decide. It'd almost like you'd have to split the board up into sections, and they would need to concentrate yeah, on a certain like area. Play... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not necessarily against solo modes that are super different from the base, but I would prefer something that feels like playing against a real opponent. It's one of the things I like about Carlos bots a lot, and I like bots generally. You know, I'm I don't I don't even mind reading the charts. I've been playing more GMT games recently. Actually, I was going to say that. Yeah. Like, My interest in Latin and Roman history and stuff has come around <laughs> to where I'm starting to get into all these historical games about Rome, and I'm really enjoying myself. Um, it's a long process, but I'm starting to teach myself Republic of Rome. I'm not sure it's going to be great solo, yeah, but I just I have to have the experience. <laughs> Does that mean? Do you ever kind of like sit there and, and look at these things and go, "This isn't accurate. They've got this completely wrong. They've kind of this." Oh my god! Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, it is agonizing. Has there been a flip the table moment um, for you where you've just went, look at that stay that's that that, that that thing and then just went right up my way. Oof. Yes. <laughs> so actually my PhD is in ancient my PhD is in ancient Christianity, actually. So I actually get that way more about games that are about religious history as well. Mm. So um I've actually recorded a comp a podcast not this past Easter, but the Easter before with Jason from Every Night is Game Night and yeah. with uh, people from Kara Games about Commissioned, yeah. about AD30, you know, those sort of Christian-themed games. And, you know, I have bones to pick as a professional <laughs> scholar of religion. I have questions. <laughs> but for me, what makes it the most interesting, it's not the historical factoids being wrong that bothers me the most. It's when games present themselves as accurate or when they kind of advance ideas about how things grew or how the world works when they're making historical statements that's where i get a little bit more fired up so in a roman game normally it's just gonna be like oh gladiators like oh no you got the gladiator wrong okay <laughs> it's i would prefer it to be right but i can live with that you know but um once you're advancing a narrative about like ah this is gonna teach you about the history of this place yeah. or this thing that's where it starts to get really interesting and I've really been enjoying increasing conversations in the board game community, not just about ancient history, but about talking about colonialism in games, talking about, you know, um, war sims and what they can and can't communicate to us, what they do and don't do to us intellectually and emotionally when we play them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that all those topics are really interesting and actually criminally underexplored so far. Do you think there's more scope for different things that can happen in solo modes as well then? As in rather than, yes. maybe, you know, take the game mechanics and maybe alter them slightly to make the solo mode almost like a separate kind of version of the game entirely. You know, you talk about Tyrants Possibly. of the Underdark kind of like making mm -hmm. it completely different. I want that. I mean, because when I play Tyrants of the Underdark, I think, man, I'd love to play the solo. What I want is to play something, you know, I want to play Tyrants of the Underdark, and I just don't want to have to wait for my friends. <laughs> 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 but I do think that there's actually a lot of room within solo gaming or within, you know, low player count gaming generally to experiment more, to create more interesting opponents that do or that mimic things mm -hmm. that maybe you don't want in a multiplayer game, even. You know, and I, you know, I think about you normally you play as the Romans, right? But I like this in something like Falling Sky, right? You get to, to you could be any one of a number of factions, so you get to know what it's like to go up against the crushing power of the Romans, or you get to know what it's like to try to like foment dissent among your fellow <laughs> Britons. Um, yeah, you know, there's a whole lot of interest in a game like that, and I'd like to see more simplified versions of that come out. I haven't played This Guilty Land yet, also from Holland Spiel, but I'm, I'm curious about that, because I feel like that's starting to really pull 
intense and difficult ideas into the world of a game. Okay. And while I like a good, you know, trashy fantasy adventure as much as anyone, I totally do. Put a dragon on it, I'll probably buy it. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I also am really interested in the kinds of depth that games can create. And I think that sometimes solo makes that easier because it's easier to confront yourself yeah. than it is to feel exposed in front of a game group. And I think that it's easier to have an intense experience with a game when you don't feel watched by others, especially people like your friends whose opinions you care about. Yeah, well, I think you can get... When I was speaking to um, Mr. Delisio about this, and it was about how this... You know, you can, the good thing about solo mode is you can take your time over it. You can do it in an hour or you can spend an entire evening on there. If you want to get emotionally invested in it, if you want to kind of almost kind of like role play kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. you can you can really kind of get involved in the kind of the solo mode side of things. Sometimes even more than if you're playing a multiplayer mode, you're relying on the emotional state of others. So if you're playing yes. as a member, if you're playing like a three-player game and one person is just completely like, you know, I'm not here tonight. I I look like I'm here. I'm moving the pieces like I'm here, but I'm emotionally kind of not available. That can kind of put a bit of a a bit of a dampener. I think that's kind of that's what's attractive to me about solo games. I've seen you can start, you can get it's weird because because for video games being the way that they are, that they seem to a lot of them be completely solo play nowadays. You can get you can get. A, you can still get kind of like an emotional reaction from a video game. And I think board games have mm-hmm. the potential to head in the same direction, depending on kind of what they do really. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that you, it, there's a richer possibility for that in a solo game. Personally, mm-hmm. I don't like to, I don't, I don't like it when I feel emotional in front of other people. I think a lot of people are like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I like to keep my feelings to more private <laughs> spheres. I mean, I'll tell you what I think about anything. You know, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm an open book. Mm-hmm. But in terms of like real emotional responses, I prefer to be able to escape from settings where those might be on display. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got um, have you got a holy grail kind of solo game that you would love to get your hands on to play to own or? All right. So I do not have $400. I would really like to try Kingdom Death Monster, but I do not have the miniature skill or the money <coughs> to make that happen. And the other thing is, I actually feel really conflicted because I want to play it, but I'm also kind of grossed out by some of the miniatures, especially the pinups. Yeah. And like, I'm unsure how much I would enjoy it in the end, which also makes it less likely that I'll spend that money. But, you know, in terms of games that I can't get hold of, you know, Yggdrasil... I don't even know how to pronounce that. I'll see, we'll say I'm close enough. <laughs> we'll live. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been wanting to play it forever. And, you know, the app had gone out of the store by the time I tried to buy the app. And it's really frustrating. And I know they, like, did a, repub- a reprint that I totally missed. So that sucked. Eventually, eventually I'll play it. <laughs> so I'm going to the, that would go to the must, the must kind of list. Um are you just going to... I mean, as far as Beyond Solitaire goes, are you just going to continue until they, you play all of the solo games? I mean, have you got further plans? Are you going to be expanding on the kind of media that you're putting out there? Um, I mean... Yeah, actually. So I do have some expansion plans because I, I have a lot of creative drive. I don't really like to just do the same thing over and over again forever. Mm-hmm. So I like what I'm doing right now as a baseline and I don't intend to stop. Mm-hmm. But I also really like to do more interviews... I'd like to do more in-depth videos about games that I really enjoy. So instead of like getting it quick on on camera and then moving on, I'd like to revisit games that I really enjoy and talk about you know what strategies are really working for me, um, you know what character combinations am I really enjoying, and actually try that stuff out. I don't know who else would be interested in it, but I would. So yeah, it's my channel. <laughs> <laughs> but I've actually also thought that it would be very interesting. To, you know, as I'm, I'm about to downsize my game collection, I've seriously considered documenting that for my channel so that yeah. people can see what that actually looks like. Um, and I'm a teacher, so I've actually been planning a series on how to teach games, but not in the terms of like, oh, start with the goal, do this, but actually more videos about how to make people feel comfortable when you're teaching them, how to spot when somebody's not totally paying attention, how to draw them back without calling them out. Yeah. Um, you know, all the sort of subtle things that you learn when trying to manipulate 30 plus teenagers in a row. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I've I've actually been considering that, you know, as a possible topic to explore because I think that that's useful information, especially as we talk about making gaming more inclusive, making it more accessible. Yeah. Part of inclusion is making everyone feel welcome um, at the entry point. So if you are learning a game, you are probably going to like that game about as much as you like the teacher. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very, very important. I think um, things like that, I mean, you, we we have how to plays, but mm-hmm. there's not there's not always a discussion about how to teach people <laughs> how to play as well, right. as in how you right. actually and instruct how to handle, them. Yeah. yeah, but also things like how to handle mistakes. Yes. How to um, how to subtly guide people towards games that you think are, are their appropriate difficulty level without making it sound like you think they're stupid. Yeah. Or like they're noobs. Yeah. Because, you know, those are all sort of delicacies that we haven't fully developed socially as a as a hobby. Um, and I, I think that those things matter for making sure that newcomers have a good experience. Because it's, you know, the other thing is I think that we have an obligation. If you're playing at a public game night and people are coming, you have an obligation to pretend, even if it's not true, that you are ready to play Splendor for the 500th time and that you love it. Yeah. Because it's not right to go and want to play your game that's like way in the deep end of the pool at a public night where, you know, you have these guests that are looking on awkwardly trying to figure out how to get into your game circle. Yeah, I mean, it could be you could be the person that helps them make the decision if this is going to be their new hobby because they're looking for right. to make new friends. They've heard the board game community is an incredibly friendly thing because this is what everybody says about the board game community being incredibly friendly and so yeah I mean Mm -hmm. sometimes you have to be the person that kind of opens out, offers your hand to somebody and says look I will take you I'll take you down this journey let's let's show you um, make it accessible for you make it open for you and make it easy for the to kind of teach which is cool Um, yeah where if people have listened along today and they say this sounds fantastic, I want to find out more about playing games by myself, where do you exist on the interweb nets? I am everywhere. I am alone and yet never alone. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so I am beyond solitaire on pretty much every platform. So I'm beyond solitaire on Board Game Geek mm. and on Instagram and on Twitter. I'm beyond solitaire at gmail.com. Uh, my YouTube channel is called Beyond Solitaire and my blog slash, well, it's not a blog anymore. It's a review site, I guess. It used to just be musings, but it's beyond solitaire.net. So I got a consistent username across all platforms. As, um, Mike Delisio, any good at talking about solo games? Yeah, Mike and I talk about solo games together all the time. <sighs> <laughs> you had a chance I to actually, slap him down there. No, so I actually feel a lot of um, connection with Mike because, I mean, yeah, I could just razz him for fun, but <laughs> I really appreciate him because he is a history teacher, so he's a teacher like me. You know, yeah. we have a lot in common. Um, you know, we have different personas i think in different ways of kind of expressing ourselves but you know mike and i are actually really really similar like surprisingly so we don't have the exact same taste but similar approaches you know similar views about you know good teaching and games and about you know how our channels should feel for us you know as we do them and all that kind of stuff so so yeah mike's lovely yeah he does solo mode games he's also on sporadically board who are officially joyous members of the dice tower network the how he pulled that off i'll never know but anyway um <laughs> we're not members of the dice tower network because i asked tom and tom said no so but if you do want to keep an eye on what we're up to head yourself to the internet uh, web nets search for we're not wizards you will find us on places like twitter and uh, um, facebook and instagram and uh, our website and you can email us, which is magic at wearenotwizards.com. And you can go to our blog, which is wearenotwizards.blogspot.com, and where we write stuff as well. But not as well as Liz does, because she's good at writing and videos. <laughs> um, also, do you feel your, your email address is contradictory? Magic at wearenotwizards.com? Yes, that's why I picked it. I dig it. <laughs> that's the whole point. 
you know, <laughs> I'm aware of the irony of the situation. That's why I chose the email address. I mean, I know. I'm just going to raise you back. It just makes it totally, like, <laughs> memorable as well. And people actually go, they do a double take. It's magic if we're not wizards. It's what? Yes, it is. Um, Love it. <laughs> you can also find us in all the places which um, those podcast catchers, which have got the word pod or the word cast in them, and also Spotify, which has got neither pod nor the word cast in it. But there you go. Um or if you like us, there's a couple of things you can do. You can tell somebody else. You know, that's always nice. Or you can go to Apple Podcasts and you can drop us a rating or a review or a subscription. If you're going to give us a rating or a review, don't give us 10 stars because, you know, this head can't get any bigger. Um, the hair is going and I'm just going to pop up like a balloon. Um, but don't give us one star because it makes us cry. Um, give us like something in the middle, like average, like five because it's average. But the person who's not being average is the rather wonderful, rather fantastic Les from Beyond Solitaire. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Yay. There's only two more things to do. First thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Les? Speak for yourself about your identity. <laughs> I, I don't, don't identify as a non-wizard. I really <laughs> can edit this to make you sound <laughs> dreadful. Um, and the <laughs> and the second th- <laughs> and the second thing is to say goodbye. So this is the second time this has happened this evening so far with people disappointing me with a wizard question. I'm not going to tell you who the other person is, just that you're going to hear their episode and you're also going to hear what I did to them. But um, the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from 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 Liz, um, who completely shocked and floored me at the very end. Say goodbye, Liz. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a goodbye. It's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Make something awful. And remember, if you are interested in finding out more about um, playing solo mode uh, games, um, I'll give you the address from Mike Delisio. But until the Why next you, time, you have me on here. Goodbye. <laughs>